Hey guys, it's Renna and Reese. Uh, we're here working from home again, um, working on social distancing. All I can say is I'm really glad this doesn't apply to dogs because I would be so sad. Um, I'm in the middle of a jewelry book explosion right now. <laughs> I've been taking this time to reacquaint myself with all of the jewelry books in my arsenal from catalogs to books by some of my idols tap in oh bye Reese <laughs> camera shy Van Cleef and our pals Bulgari oh, so many more oh this is a good one Cartier more Cartier Hans Nadelhofer he's great anyway the book I want to talk to you about today is The Impossible Collection of Jewelry. This is an am amazing book by Vivian Becker. It weighs about 600 pounds. It's one of these gigantic acetylene books. Uh, makes me feel a little bit like Alice in Wonderland right now. Um, Vivian, if you don't know her, is... Uh, an incredible jewelry historian who I respect and admire immensely. Uh, she's written dozens of books. I recommend you find some of her books, follow her on Instagram. She is a contributing editor to many publications. Um, go seek out that which she writes. She is very eloquent and puts into words some of the dilemmas uh, I think of often when it comes to jewelry. Uh, my background, I don't know if you're aware, maybe, uh, I worked my way up through the Sotheby's jewelry department. I started as a sale admin and eventually ended up on the specialist team. Uh, it was there that I really began considering what made a jewel important why what story is it telling is it is it in the design is it who gave it to you is there's so many different elements here right uh, for me obviously I, I don't necessarily work with huge stones but I like to tell the story I like to hold on to this piece I like to feel the heft and I like to talk to have a 360 degree artifact. I think of the, my pieces as artifacts. Um, I'd like to just think about jewelry, think about my things, and and take you through The Impossible Collection of Jewelry by Vivian Becker. I'm going to start with a few words by her and then just um, show you some of the amazing gems that she features. Because, yeah. So, For a jewel to be truly timeless, it must embody the essence of its moment in time. And while eternity is built into the very being of a precious jewel, the gold refashioned through millennia, the gems eons old and invincible, timelessness is another matter altogether. An important jewel is the quintessential heirloom. And its timelessness comes from the perfect confluence of design, craftsmanship, and preciousness, as well as a message and meaning. Yeah, message and meaning. For me, that's the part I take away the most, but um, I'd love to hear what everybody else just thinks about that. Um, well said. Um, I think this is important to m note this moment in time, it's, uh, it's in relation to the Art Nouveau movement. At the genesis of the 20th century, metamorphosis was in the air, and the jewel was changing from a superficial trinket into a poetic work of art. Um, this is where we really begin to think of jewelry as art, artist, or jeweler as artist, artist as jeweler, and these overlaps. Um, this is when things get really exciting. Uh,
And then finally, something I also think about often, and she just nails. Uh, these breakthroughs highlighted a dilemma. The grand gem important for the rarity and value of its content versus the jewel prize for design, artistry, and craftsmanship. This is a dilemma. I agree. All right, let's look at the jewels. Uh, all right, I'm gonna have to turn this around, I think. Right. Do you think they make this in pocket sized? Okay. My boyfriend always makes fun of me for saying, okay, okay, sorry, but okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna show you every piece. I wish I could. I don't think you guys have the bandwidth. I don't know. Do people want want to go through every piece? Maybe. Yeah. Um, oh, here we have this beautiful carved emerald. I wasn't gonna talk about that one, but now that I stopped on it, it's really beautiful. So this is 1910. We have these beautiful little pearls, um, these calibre cut sapphires here. This is all really the beginning of what we're about to see a lot of in the 20s and 30s, uh, especially with these car this carved piece. Uh, this to me is very, uh, very forward thinking for this time. Uh, we're about to see a lot of that when we flip through uh, in the decades to come. This is this is extremely beautiful. Polarib, very beautiful. Okay, but where was I really gonna start? I have this one. Oh, I mean, where else? Question number one, would I wear this today? Yes, 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 yes. Tiara's always in. Actually, can we bring back the tiara? I'd like to do that. Especially tiaras with feathers. Wow, so this is 1914. Um, Chaumet. So Chaumet is a French jewelry house, as I'm sure you all know. Um, really known this this time period was its heyday. Uh, this workmanship, these this real sense of action and movement here um, is quintessentially Chaumet. Um, wow, I just I have no words. I love it. Very different. This is nine years later. Now we're looking at 1923. This is Georges Fouquet. Uh, look how modern these lines are. This all one color. This is all jade. This is um, incredibly modern compared to this. In just nine years, this is where we've come. Is that crazy to you? It's crazy to me. Uh, these stark colors, here I'm sure when you wear it, there's this movement in the beads um, and just the monochrome and these hard lines. It's This is really, really timeless and something that you would see today. Um, so this, this is an important jewel. Would I wear it? Yes. I'm gonna keep asking, would I wear that? Let's see what I say. Oh, Suzanne Bell Perron. So speaking of these few jewelers that are so few and far between that meld artistry, storytelling, craftsmanship, Suzanne Bell Perron is at the top of my list, along with James de Givenchy, uh, Jar, Joel Arthur Rosenthal, and uh, Victoire de Castellan, I think those are my top picks for jewelers who are really able to tell a story. Um, whether it be using a large important stone or lack thereof and innovation. So, very famous quote by Suzanne. My style is my signature and that is so true when you see her pieces, there is nothing like them. Um, people have copied her but doesn't do justice. She is enigmatic. Uh, look at this hammered gold. It's so bulbous. It's, oh, this open cuet. I can see the gold right through in the picture. 
Love it. Would I wear it? Yes. 1923. Ooh. Ooh. One of my favorites. So we actually sold this when I worked at Sotheby's. Right here. Over a million dollars in 2013. This is 1924. It's the beginning of Egyptomania. Uh, keep in mind that it's Cartier. Sorry, it's Cartier. Keep in mind the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922 and bringing back fragments of ancient Egypt became um, all the rage. So Cartier got his hands on some faience and created about 150, we believe, uh, jewelry pieces uh, with this ancient, with these literally ancient artifacts embedded in them. This is the goddess Sekhmet. Um, I know right now we're talking about jewels with meaning, um, talismans, symbols of strength, symbols that make us feel closer to our families, protection. Uh, talk about this one. Yeah, this is this is the protection piece. Um, and it will only run you about a million dollars. Um, this is incredible. Uh, I urge you to check out the sale. There's also some other pieces um, from, oh, I pinned it. Um, look at that fitted box. Oh, fitted box really gets me, that fitted box. There are some other pieces here from this collection, which are all incredibly special. Um, this this sale is one of my ver very favorite sales ever of any auction. Um, December 11th, 2013, Magnificent Jewels. It's a good one. Okay, would I wear it today? Yes, going on. Daisy Fellows. These VCA bracelets, oh, could you just imagine wearing them and having them dangle down your wrist? Is that just like sensual? Look at that. Oh, I feel like I'm wearing them right now. Um, these tumble beads, uh, 1926, this is really, um, really reflective of this um, tutti frutti, uh, Indian inspired jewelry. That's, we're about to see a lot of, um, in the years following this. Uh, and then this incredibly beautiful structured bracelet, um, coming down the wrist is also a very Eastern in influence. Uh, and we'll see a lot of that in jewelry. So, I mean, India as a, as a jewelry powerhouse is, um, is just incredibly inspirational. So, I mean, yes, would I wear it? Yes. I'm just gonna keep turning up on the ones that I wanted to. This is another piece of jewelry that is ironically, is it ironic? Weirdly, coincidentally, in this catalog. Um, it goes without saying I would never wear it today because it has ivory, which we don't, we don't um, wear, we don't sell, we don't support. We being the royal we, all of a sudden I've started using that. Don't know why. Um, but it's an incredible Boucheron piece. Malachite. Just look at the way that these pieces all fit together. There's no, really, it looks like they're invisible, floating with each other. I believe, if I remember, it was set on a, on a spring. And you could just slide it on and off your wrist. It's really important. Um, Boo Ivory, though. So no, I would not wear this. 